So, when we left off, um, the wickedness had, had multiplied on the earth. And now Moses is going to tell us just how bad that is. So, beginning in verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I think Moses knew the objection we might go, well, well not, every, not every intention, not ev-. No, he, he pretty specifically makes it clear. The wickedness of man was great in the earth, And then then he intensifies it, right? And he says, every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This, yeah, this this is the thing. Right. As as their fathers were, so are the children. And the wickedness just multiplies. And that's, that's, that's where the earth is. Verse 6, and the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. Yeah, he's he's very disappointed in us. No, (laughs) not not only is is he wrathful over sin, he's, he's so wrathful, he's sorry that he made man. Yeah, that's very sobering. Um, if you have the King James, it's going to say it repenteth the Lord, uh, something like this. Um, it's, it does not mean the Lord is repenting of his own sin. It, it, it means he, he regrets having done it, right? Yeah. He, for, first of all, the Hebrew language works this way. Hebrew is not Greek, not only in the fact that it's not Greek, but Greek is the consummate language for abstraction. I mean, that's why you have philosophy rise up out of Greek. Greek loves abstractions. Power, authority, omniscience. Um, Hebrew uses more earthly terms. So, for example, and you do this too, by the way. You, you usually don't talk about your soul. You talk about your heart, right? And when you talk about your heart, I mean, unless you're talking about like cholesterol or something, you're not talking about the muscle inside your chest cavity. You're talking about that, your spirit, right? That part of you that is eternal, non-physical, right? And, and really, more to the point, who you really are. But at this point, God does not have a heart. Don't take that the wrong way. I mean, God is spirit. He hasn't taken on flesh yet. He doesn't possess that organ in our chest that human beings have. He will, that's what Christmas is about, but um, at least the second person of the Trinity will. But um, when it talks about God's heart, it means to his core. Right. So like in, in the Psalms, for example, we don't talk about God's power because of Hebrew, we talk about his right arm. We don't talk about God's omniscience, his all-knowingness in Hebrew, we talk about his eye, right? That's, that's how Hebrew works. It... it Poetically, it's really nice because it is so concrete. It's not quite so abstract. But, but yeah, when it talks about his heart, that's, that's what we mean. Yes. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the spread of sin on the earth is so great, he's going to destroy all of it. I mean, spoilers, but he's going to destroy the earth. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it certainly looks like the devil's winning. And, and of course, the Lord's not going to be able to abide that. So, yeah, again, spoilers, but at the beginning of chapter 8, we're going to be told that the Lord remembered Noah because in the days of the flood, it's going to seem to Noah like maybe he didn't. Because, again, you're, you're going to see this when we get through the, the verses, but the flood does not last for 40 days. It takes 40 days for the flood to crest. The, the waters hang around much longer than that. So they're, they're in the boat much longer than 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, but we'll get there. <clears throat> so, verse 7, the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. That's sad. It's, it's yeah, it's shocking, right? Because... In Genesis 1, in Genesis 2, 
the Lord is making the earth, and he even sets the lights in the heavens to be signs and seasons for man. <clears throat> so man was always the point. It's not like God was creating and just as an afterthought, he threw mankind you know, out there. Yeah, well, why not? Well, let, let's make someone like us and we'll just throw them out there. I mean, the, everything was leading to this. It's not like God said, I was sorry that I created the mosquito or something. It was, you know, this was, <laughs> he's, he's sorry that he made the crown of creation. The, the, yeah, I, I definitely have beef with mosquitoes. It's one of the great things about living in Lubbock. Um, but, so he's, he's going to wipe out the earth. He's going to destroy it. And yet, there's this little glimmer of hope in the next verse. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So on the one hand, Moses writes that every thought of man's heart was only evil all the time. Only evil continuously. On the other hand, Noah finds favor in the eyes of the Lord. How does Noah, this is a catechism question, how does Noah find favor in the eyes of the Lord? Faith, yep. Noah is going to be seven, thank you. So Hebrews eleven seven. 7. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household, by this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Right, so... What does it mean he condemned the world? Well, no, um, Noah condemned the world. He's, yeah, he's, he's rejecting the world, right? Because again, how long does it take him to build the boat? hundred years. And so for a hundred years, here's crazy old man Noah talking about this coming flood. Um, and so for a hundred years, he endures the scorn of these wicked men. But that's the point. He's, he's, Noah is willing to condemn or reject the world in favor of the promise that, of something he hasn't seen yet. And that's the lesson we're supposed to learn from Noah, because there are things that God has promised us we haven't seen yet. Namely, another destruction of the world. Not by water, again, spoilers, but not by water, um, but by fire. So the destruction is very real. However, also, like the days of Noah, the remnant will be preserved through that destruction. So this is the thing, right? 120 years... The clock starts ticking, right? When we read that last week, God says your days will be 120 years. And yeah, on the one hand, it does seem to kind of set an absolute cap on how long a man is going to live after the flood. But also, it's 120 years from those words until the flood. And for 120 years, Noah is preaching, the world will end, so that those who were destroyed in those days cannot tell Jesus when they see him, well, no one told me there was going to be a flood. Yeah, remember that crazy old man building the boat you laughed at? He told you. You didn't listen to him. For a hundred years he told you. So Noah finds favor in the eyes of the Lord by faith. Right? Verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah. Remember how we talked about Genesis being divided into generations? The Toledoth? Well, this is now the generation of Noah. So, in other words, this is going to be the story of Noah and his descendants. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So, notice, you have a little James 2 going on here, in that... On the one hand, Noah found favor with God. We know this is only by faith. However, that faith is not an idle thing. Just Noah assented to the right doctrine and that was enough. B, 
because Noah had faith, Noah walked with God, right? And, and that walking is an active verb for a reason. Faith is not supposed to be just, I mean, it, it is receptive in the sense that you're receiving the benefits of God, but it does not cause one to become passive. That faith causes one to act sometimes in heroic sorts of ways, like enduring the scorn of a wicked generation that God was about to blot out for a hundred years, building this giant ship that even now would be a massive undertaking, but for a man of 500 years um, is extraordinary. Yeah, I don't, it's, it's hard. it is hard to imagine a lot of this stuff. I mean, to, to put yourself in, in their shoes, like Methuselah dies like the year of the flood. Um, what all had he seen? He had seen most of world history by that point. Um, that's, that's enormous. Um, so Noah has three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, right? So that's going to set the pattern for the number eight to figure into this. Because after all, Noah, his three sons, and their, their wives... And by the way, you do have in the Bible examples of people taking multiple wives, but when the Lord is going to reset creation, each man has a single wife. And so, our baptismal font is in what shape? It's an octagonal prism, right? Why octagonal? Eight people, right? And that's very, very, very traditional for baptismal fonts. Now the question is, awesome, now the question is, what on earth does the flood of Noah have to do with Christian baptism? Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. I mean, I, I think you all could probably draw the comparison yourself pretty well, but it comes directly from the Bible. Hey, how many of you remember how to diagram a sentence? Remember, subject, verb, direct object, all your modifiers. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Look at First Peter 3, beginning at like 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. So, Peter's talking about death and life, right? That we in the flesh are being put to death, but we are being made alive in God. Right? And... Peter also talks about God's patience waiting in the days of Noah. Because remember, he's, he's grieved that he makes man. He regrets having made mankind. And yet he does not immediately, therefore, destroy the earth. His patience waits because he's saving Noah and his sons and their wives. I mean, other, other people have the opportunity. They, they hear the preaching of Noah, but... Um, Right. And then you have 1 Peter 3.21. This is a verse all of you should commit to memory. Um, if you go through catechism, you'll have to. Baptism, which corresponds to this, which is to say the flood, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the res resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. So, diagramming 1 Peter 3.18 what is the subject? The verb? The object? So if anyone ever asks you, where in the Bible does it say baptism saves you? You can tell them, 1 Peter 3.21. Yes, baptism saves. But notice, 
Peter sees a correlation to the point that Peter uses a, a term. He says baptism is a, and in the Greek, the word is type. Now, type doesn't just mean kind. It also specifically means a foreshadowing. Something looking forward that will be fulfilled. So, the flood is anticipating Christian baptism. The flood destroys. The flood kills. But it preserves. It purifies. It kills the unrighteousness and leaves alive the righteous. You died when you were baptized. You were made new in baptism. Right? That's that whole born again thing. That's that John 3 thing. Um, Peter draws a, a direct connection that the flood is anticipating Christian baptism. It's looking forward to it. And what happened in the days of Noah happens in each of us who are baptized. So on the one hand, God's wrath, very, very real, stern, but his grace is, is always there. His salvation is always available for those who, who believe. Or really, it could be seen as though the, the, that baptism is a reenactment of the flood, but the way that Peter uses the word type, it's almost like the flood is a reenactment of baptism. Because the Greek word corresponds to type as anti-type. Okay, so back to Genesis 6. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So it's not just that there was sin, but what specific sin seemed to be beset the whole world? Violence, right? In the days of Lot, it's going to be, shall we say, more six commandment type stuff. Um, and there will be destruction in the days of Lot specifically on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, but here, the, the besetting sin seems to be violence, right? And that corresponds with um, the, the Nephilim that we saw earlier in chapter 6. That, they're, that these, are, these are mighty men, and they, they seem to be riding roughshod over the, the weak and the poor, right? So the earth is filled with violence, and the Lord is, is determined to destroy the earth. Look at verse 14. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Gopher is just a transliteration from the Hebrew. Um, it's probably some kind of cypress. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. What's pitch? Tar. So where does, where does the tar go, the pitch go? On the outside and the inside, right? So it's going to have rooms inside, so it's not just a big cargo ship. It, it's divided into rooms. And it's got pitch. The point of the pitch is for, yeah, it's, it's caulking, it's sealant, it, it keeps the water out. I mean, the idea is that the boats survive this, right? Yeah. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. What's a cubit? Figure foot and a half. Yeah. Foot and a half, right? 18 inches, give or take. Um, so 450 feet, 75 feet wide, and 40 some odd feet tall. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. So the ark was to have windows and ventilation. Exactly where this, this cubit above is supposed to be is not entirely clear, and I guess it doesn't ultimately matter. Um, the, the point is, is that, again, this thing is built for survival. It's not really built for navigation. It doesn't have a propulsion system. There's not a sail or an engine or a reactor or something. Um, it's just, it's just going to float there. And it's going to be carried about. Um, but, uh, but it is built for survival. And so light can get in, air can get in. 
For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. Right? So that includes man, mammals, birds, reptiles. He didn't need to bring the fish in because, I mean, come on. <laughs> right, fish are going to be okay. Yes, make it with a lower, oh, sorry, make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will est establish my covenant with you and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Okay, so first of all, this is the first instance we have of this word covenant. Right? A covenant is a promise. Some people try to make a covenant into a contract, kind of, but not entirely, because the covenants are much more one-sided than we tend to think contracts are. God simply says, I'm going to do this, and then you're going to do this. But it's not, if you do this, then you'll, you know. It's, God doesn't say, if you do this, then I'll send a flood. No, I'm sending the flood, and this is what you're going to do. Now, but that's law. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, so where's the gospel in all this, God, huh? The, the, the gospel is, he's warning them. He's not wiping out humanity entirely. You know that because you're here. Rather, he's going to kind of restart creation. So, he warns the one righteous, build the ark, this is how you're going to build it, then you're going to get in. Yes, yes. And that was the Old Testament covenant was always the promise of Christ, simply looking forward and now we're looking, you know what a pug is? A pug can look backward and forward at the same time, that's kind of where we are. <laughs> On the one hand, we're looking back at the manger, back at the cross, what God has already done, but not everything is yet delivered, so we're looking in the future too. Old Testament Israel is pretty well looking into the future. And the more they look in the present, the more disappointing it gets because all of, all of the people that were supposed to have been saviors, Cain, David, uh, they're not. They're not the Messiah. Um, so we have the first coming of Christ that we look back to, but we also have the second coming that we're looking forward to. So we're kind of doing that pug thing where we're stuck looking both backward and forward. That, I mean, that's, that's the tension of Advent, right? Is that you're living at the, at, the, at the one hand in the manger and at the other hand on the last day. Whereas they're looking pretty well forward. But it's to the same comings. Um, so notice... God will establish the covenant with Noah, right? And that covenant is going to be a promise, and we know, of course, that promise is that he will not destroy the earth by a flood again. Now, when it comes to um, small print, the by a flood thing is pretty important because the Lord will destroy the earth again. It just won't be with a flood. So Noah, his three sons, and the four wives are going to come into the ark, and also the animals. Verse 20, of the birds according to their kinds and of the animals according to their kinds. It's a good reminder, by the way, that in, in our taxonomy, animal, like birds are a subset of animals, but God's taxonomy is not exactly the one we learned in biology class. So like mammals can include what we would call amphibians, or like, rep, sorry, reptiles could include like what we would call amphibians. That's okay. Um, amphibians are just wet reptiles. I was not a biology major. <laughs> um, but, but understand that, that all the things that live on the earth, they're going to come according to their kind, right? And that's not necessarily, you know, 
Linnaean taxonomy where, you know, if, if the bird has a slightly great, greater curve to its beak, it's a new species. May not be that specific. Um, but according to their kind, that is, when they reproduce, they'll make one of themselves, they're going to be brought in. Two of every sort shall come into you to keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. So again, you see the Lord's intent in preserving life in the ark, at least. Outside the ark is a very different story. But inside the ark, the Lord is intent on preserving life. Not only is the, the ark sturdily built, it's large for its purpose and for its day. I mean, it's like half the size of the Titanic. So hardly roomy, but it'll do the job, right? Um, it's got three decks. Presumably they've got ladders and things to get between the decks. Um, and then there's provision for food, right? Because that many people, that many animals, they're going to need to eat. Again, the idea is that they all survive this. And so that's the provision. And notice, by the way, the animals will come to you, right? Um, two of every source shall come into you. How's Noah going to make that happen? Yeah. Come here, tiger. Come here, tiger. Right. It's... The Lord will, by means of a miracle, gather the animals and present them to the ark, right? And notice verse 22. The last chapter ended with, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord, and now look at, at, at 622. What does Noah's faith look like? He did everything the Lord commanded him, Right? Yes, that's that James 2, faith without works is dead thing. Noah's faith is not a dead ascent to just intellectual propositions. It's living. Noah believed that, one, when God said he's going to destroy the earth, Noah knew he means it. But he also knew, if God is telling me that he's going to destroy the earth, there's only one reason you would tell someone in advance, and that is, he intends you to survive it. And so he gives them the, the, the commands how to build the, the ark. And Noah believes what the Lord tells him and does what the Lord commands, right? So you would think that, well, but, but that's exactly what the rich man thought in Luke 16. The rich man thought, yeah, but could I just go back and warn my brothers? And, and, and Abraham says, you know, look, they've got, they've got Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. And, and, and you end up with this haunting verse, this haunting foreshadowing. Even if someone came back from the dead, they won't listen. And of course, the Lord's going to come back from the dead, and, and many don't listen. Nice. Genesis 7. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. So the countdown started seven days, Right? Noah's commanded to bring how many animals on the ark? No. Seven pairs of all clean animals. Uh oh, no. Somebody's now, this is, a, this is a new concept. This is the first time this concept shows up in the Bible. And, of course, the existence of clean already implies the existence of unclean. Right? Later on in the Bible... This will be explained in much greater detail, but evidently Noah had some knowledge of what made for a clean and unclean animal. Typically, the clean animals are the ones that are prey. So a clean bird would be like a chicken. Chickens are ultimate prey animals. Like Their only defense is just fertility. They can lay an egg every day. You can get three generations in in a year. I mean, chickens can just outbreed the, the appetites of their predators. <laughs> Um, 
But even, even the, the, the mammals, typically the clean animals are going to be prey. And um, hogs are not prey animals, by the way. Ask, ask hog farmers. Um, so like the, the unclean birds are like the, the raptors, the vultures, the eagles and stuff. Um, but it's, it's a little bit different. Clean animals, seven pairs. Unclean animals, one pair. Why seven pairs of, unclean, of clean animals? To sacrifice. The, the Lord has not yet given to man to eat animals. That doesn't happen until Genesis chapter 9. But it's already in anticipation of sacrifice. And remember, Abel sacrificed of the first of his flocks. He was a, remember, he was a sheep herder, a shepherd. He gave of the first of his flocks. So the clean animals, seven pairs, unclean animals, one pair. Okay. Verse 6. Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters came upon the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood, of clean animals and of animals that are not clean and of birds and of everything that creeps on the ground, two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah as God had commanded Noah. And after seven days, the water of the flood came upon the earth. So it's actually not just two of every, of every animal, right? But it's a male and a female. Why? Not all the questions are hard, right? Um, the intent is that God will repopulate the earth. As a matter of fact, after the flood, God will intensify the command that he gave to creation in the days of the, of the creation. Because he'll say, not only be fruitful and multiply, he'll command, fill the earth. And that command is given both to the animals and to man. They ate the food that was stored in the ark for them. It's, it is staggering to think about. Nice. Verse 17. So notice, by the way, who shuts the door? The Lord does. That was the command, right? Make the door on the side of the ark. God shuts it. The f- I mean, this is the thing, right? Is that even as God is meeting out his punishment on all hu- humanity, he shuts the door of the ark because he intends to preserve the remnant. Which, if you happen to find yourself in the days when violence and, and wickedness are rampant on the earth, and it feels like God is probably just waiting until something is going to happen before he destroys the earth. Because you can feel that God's destruction is surely imminent. If you happen to find yourself living in those days, remember that in the days of the flood, the Lord shut the door. In other words, he shut the door to preserve the remnant, to preserve faithful Noah, right? So the question is, when the Lord's destruction comes, where is the place that you can go to be safe from the destruction? And this is why church architects typically build a church in the shape of a boat, right? The part of the church where we sit, not where I sit, but where everyone else sits, is called the the nave, right? From the Latin word navis, from which we get navy, right? And in in a cathedral-style sanctuary, chancel, um, you know, nave. If you look up, especially if you have the nice arches in the, in the beams, it looks like the inside of a ship upside down. That's intentional. The point is, inside the ark there was salvation and life. Outside the ark there is only death, right? So, in our day, where's the only place you can go to be safe? The church. Right? And again, when we talk about the church, we don't mean like the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod Incorporated. We're talking about that body of all believers of all time, right? To include many from the Lutheran churches, but all of those who call on the name of Christ, that is the church, the capital C church, 
that is the communion of saints. But, you know, artwork is supposed to teach, and architecture is one of the highest of the arts, if not the highest art. Um, and the, the teaching is outside of the church, and again, by church we mean the capital C, the body of believers. Outside the church there is death. Inside the church there is salvation and life. Right? The Lord closes the door because he intends to preserve Noah. It's an act of love and grace, even as he's doling out the punishment on literally the rest of the earth. Okay. If you can bear those two thoughts in your mind at the same time, you understand the distinction between law and gospel pretty well. Okay. Verse 17. The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them fifteen cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died, in other words, if you had gills, you were okay. If you had nostrils, you're not, right? He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark, and the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. So they're not just in for 40 days. Now they're in, 40 days is just the crest. And at one point in human history, the ark was the highest thing on the earth because everything else was under the water. Mount Ararat, 16,000 feet, it's underwater. I think Hockley County got an inch or two. <laughs> um, yeah, right. <laughs> so the, the, the whole thing, and there have been attempts to try to make this into a local flood. It's not. The mountains are covered. Everything's covered. The whole earth. And notice, by the way, it's the position of the ark is not just physical. I mean, it is physical. The ark is above the waters. But notice, the ark is borne up. It's lifted up. It's exalted. Even as mankind is being blotted out, the saints are being lifted up. That, I mean, that's, that's all... That's, that's what judgment looks like. God blots out the wicked, he lifts up the godly. And that's now so many skeeters. So many skeeters. Okay. Chapter 8. So we're already 150 days in. Not quite half a year, but getting there. And notice the first thing we're told in chapter 8. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. So, it, kind of, it, it, it at least raises the question for me, does that mean that Noah wondered if God remembered him? You know, 150 days in the ark, and what do you look when you see out, or what do you see when you look outside? Just water, only water, so much water, um, and probably stuff floating on the water. Um, right, and and so we're told specifically the Lord remembered him; he didn't forget him. Right. And, and that, that means not only that the Lord preserves his physical life, but he remembers him in that he's godly. And he remembers the promise that he's going to be making to Noah. Because remember, we're, we're already told, I'm going to establish my covenant with you, dear Noah. So the Lord remembers that he's going to be doing that. God is faithful, yes. And so 150 days in, Noah is reminded, God keeps his promises. And, and look, that the, the fate of the beasts is somewhat tied in with the fate of man. 
Because when, when God preserves the man and his sons and their wives, he does the same for the beasts. When God remembers Noah, he also remembers the animals. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained and the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters continued to abate until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So Ararat is about 16,000 feet. I think that's taller than anything in Colorado. Um, maybe. Um, so that's kind of the first thing that the ark hits on, sticks to, and lands on as the waters recede. And notice, where's the water coming from? It's coming from under the deep and from the firmament above, from both, right? And now the waters are abating, they're receding back into the deep. Okay. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven. It went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she returned to him to the ark for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So no one knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove, and she did not return to him any more. So Noah is trying to figure out if it's safe to leave the ark by sending forth birds, right? And the, the goal is, you send out the bird, and if they can't find any place to rest, they'll come back. Send forth the bird, they can't find any place to rest, they'll come back. He sends forth the dove. The dove doesn't leave. It, it brings forth a leaf as a promise to Noah, look, here's life, right? Life is returning to the earth. Or the, 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 the raven returned, then the dove was sent, and the dove came back with, a, with an olive leaf. In the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. Then God said to Noah, Go out from the ark, you and your wife, and your sons and your sons' wives with you, Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him, every beast, every creeping thing, every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. So remember, Noah removes the cover and he looks out and he sees what does he see? The waters are dried. But that doesn't mean that you necessarily walk out immediately because that just means there's what? Mud. Well, that as well. I bet the creepy things loved it. I'm sure the sharks were very happy. Um, so, the second month, 27th day of the month, the earth had finally dried out. Right, So for two months, Noah had the cover off the ark and he was looking out, waiting for the, the earth to dry out. And finally, God will tell Noah, go out from the ark. But not just you, you and who else? Your sons, their wives, and all the animals. And look, look what God tells them. That they may swarm on the earth. Who's they? Is that mankind or the animals? Both. Mosquitoes. Right? Yeah. Why is it important for us to remember that part of the command? Because there is a very powerful thought out there that says that mankind is a parasite on the earth and that somehow the animals were there first because they buy into this weird mythology and... And therefore, mankind is wrong to exist on the earth. 
is wrong to populate, we're wrong to have children, we're wrong to cut down forests to, to make use of them, we're wrong to um, civilize places, and yet what does the Lord who made all of it say? Fill it up! Fill it up, animals, fill it up, man! So they did. They go out. Everything goes out from the ark. We'll pick it up there next week. Let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you.